One of the most special things about working and living here in the Bay Area is just the overwhelming uh, species richness and biodiversity and having the opportunity to work with a, this real, real rich environment and ecosystem dynamics that are occurring here in the Bay Area. The interactions between wildlife and humans and the interactions between the urban wildlife interfaces is, is pretty remarkable. One of the primary concerns as far as wildlife and our species here in the Bay Area for the East Bay Park District is some of it's the human wildlife interactions and conflicts that occasionally arise. Things like interactions between people walking, recreational users and coyotes or uh, potential interactions with mountain lions and some of these larger carnivores. And then also some of the situations where the urban interface, urban wildlife interface occurs where we're having uh, animals off the park to, from the park district or vice versa, moving in and out uh, within those two boundary areas because these species simply don't see boundaries the way we perceive boundaries. The boundary between humans and wildlife is constantly shifting. It is a, it is a, a very, very fluid thing. And if you think about it, especially in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, you can walk out your door and any moment of any day see an animal. It may be an animal that's just flying past. It may be an animal that has decided to move in underneath your deck that you don't want there. It may be a beautiful animal like a, a songbird that is sitting on your feeder, or it could be a, a frightening animal like a coyote walking down your street. The a number of ways that humans and animals come into contact with each other, especially in this area. They're just endless. So Wildcare's Wildlife Hospital treats between three and 4,000 animals every year, and those come in from about 200 different species. Constantly astonishes me the level of expertise that our wildlife hospital staff has to have to treat everything from the tiniest baby hummingbird, which is you know the size of my fingernail, to a coyote, an adult coyote or an adult bobcat, and we see that whole array. Now, the vast majority of the patients that come into the wildlife hospital are what you would consider backyard wildlife. These are the animals that come through your yard that are detouring or are moving around your neighborhood. They're animals that live in close proximity to us. So that's your songbirds, that's your thrushes, it's your finches, it's your jays. The mammals, it's your squirrels. It's animals like skunks and raccoons that have figured out ways to live with humans and take advantage of things like our trash. Now, you actually benefit from those animals too, because the number one thing that raccoons eat are rats and mice. So if you have a raccoon even denning underneath your house, yes, that can be sort of a disconcerting thing, but if you have a family of raccoons under your house, you don't have a problem with rodents. Skunks are a similar thing. Skunks, first of all, are very benign animals. They are lovely creatures and when it comes down to it, skunks don't want to spray you. They have a limited amount of spray available for themselves. They don't actually want to use it on you, so giving the skunk time to get away from you is a way to properly avoid that negative interaction. But if you have a skunk in your yard, you may not want your dog to be sprayed by it, but you're not going to have slugs or snails. You're not going to have a problem with those animals. Skunks love slugs and snails. They'll keep your garden clean. So animals that we see in our yards on a regular basis, I think the, the concept, the idea is that these animals are nuisances. But wild care works really hard and we really want people to get the message that these animals are part of the ecosystem and as part of the ecosystem, they actually do benefit human beings. To expand on that, you know, one of the benefits of having some of these larger carnivores or larger animals such as coyotes, mountain lions, and, and bobcats, and even fox for that perspective, they're, they're predators, they're, they're predacious. And there's a thing that a lot of ecologists refer to as top-down effect. Their effect on the ecosystem is essential to having a diverse, maintained ecosystem that doesn't really shift to a different direction that might have some unforeseen consequences. For example, when some of these larger predators are removed, often you'll see what we call an ecologically released situation where coyote populations might expand, consequently might actually have more negative encounters with human beings, such as going after people's pets or going after livestock or or having an effect on the overall wildlife community by taking out 
more animals and prey populations that they would do if they were somewhat suppressed by a larger carnivore such as mountain lions. <laughs> About 20 years now, we've been doing a, a long-term study in Elementary Creek, Sonoma Lonely Regional Wilderness, which is one of the park district systems. And it's a remote area, so it, it's pretty pristine habitat. And the study has is multifaceted. One is looking at overall biodiversity and species richness. The other is looking at primarily a riparian community. And recently, in the last several years, what we ended up doing is we ended up using remote cameras to help us assess the species richness. One of the species that we're primarily focused on is mountain lions and some of the other carnivores. And what these remote camera arrays have done is, is actually provided some quite remarkable information for us. In the, about a two year period of time, we've gotten over almost 400 photographs of mountain lions. It's 396 photos to date. And from all those photos, we've been able to identify nine different individuals of mountain lions in that particular region. We have adult females, we have adult males, we have females with dependent kittens. And the nine mountain lions are within an 11 kilometer square area, which is considered really, really high density. To put it in perspective, a real high density elsewhere where there's been really a remote terrain and high, highly suitable habitat for mountain lions, the densities are five to six mountain lions per 100 kilometer square. So what we think's happened is that we've strategically placed the cameras in a really remarkable place to where we've been able to document these overlapping home ranges of these cats. As we expand the study from the Sonoma Ohlone Regional Wilderness, which is pretty contiguous habitat, so we expect predator populations and prey populations to be fairly viable, fairly stable. But as you move into other parts of the East Bay, where there's highly altered, fragmented habitat, and you have these isolated islands of open space, where you expect to find the behavior and movements of these animals more restricted, and the, the populations are going to be less viable, and the densities are going to be lower. So maintaining habitat connectivity or connectivity between different open space areas in the Bay Area is essential to maintain certain species population. And so habitat modifications, people need places to live and we're developing more residential sites, we're developing more industrial sites. And the park district is trying to maintain as much open space land as we possibly can in perpetuity as natural habitat areas to provide um, areas and refuge for species to persist. One of the challenges is maintaining that connectivity. They come against other stressors and one of the stressors that has been recently identified here in the state of California in the Bay Area is rodenticides. So wild care is in an interesting position with the three to four thousand animals we get every year. We have one primary research project is our program to test the predatory animals that we accept into the wildlife hospital for exposure to rat poisons. So since 2006, we have been testing all predatory animals, so all animals that are carnivorous and eat rats and mice, sending it to a lab and using that data to determine what level of exposure there is in the environment. Now, shockingly enough, based on our tests over the last almost 10 years, 86% of the wildlife that we have tested test positive for rat poison. These poisons are called anticoagulant rodenticides. So these are, they, they function by preventing the ability for blood to clot. So by taking the poison road into its body, the hawk or the owl or the fox then ends up with anticoagulant poisoning as well. If 86% of the patients, the wildlife patients that we test in the hospital, show at least some exposure to rat poisons, that can be extrapolated to say that 80, approximately 86% of the animals that you see walking around, the animals that you see in your environment, also are carrying a heavy load of rat poison in their systems. They're walking around, they're living with this poison in their systems, whether it's at a subclinical level, sublethal level, but nonetheless, that means that, that it shows you how much these poisons are being used by people and influencing the natural environment around us. One of the things that people really value are, are animals, and there's a famous quote by Charles Darwin, the most notable attribute of mankind is the love of all creatures. People love animals, they love all kinds of animals, whether it's frogs, fish, birds, mammals, large carnivores like mountain lions or small fluffy things. People just have a real close association with the animals. And the nice thing about it, having the park district here and having these large open space areas is that allows the opportunity for people 
that are normally, most of their lives are in these urban centers or suburban centers that come up, escape from that type of environment and actually experience some of these situations and encounters for themselves. And I think people put a huge value to that. They really, really, it's, it's very, very important for, for basically their the overall quality of life for individuals within this community.